you won't believe this, ladies and gentlemen. My microphone is not working, and I'm having trouble getting my script. But you hold on. Welcome, everybody. And here we go. All right. Welcome to episode 45 of the ForensicWeek.com show. I'm your host, Tom Moriello, coming to you not from Laurel, Maryland, but from Indian Shores, Florida, CEO of Forensic IQ Incorporated and professor at the University of Maryland, Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Tonight, bloodstain pattern analysis and crime scene reconstruction with special guest NCIS special agent and professor at George Washington University, Elizabeth Toomer. Professor Toomer has 40, <laughs> 10 years, excuse me, Elizabeth, 10 years of law enforcement investigative and forensic science case experience, including bloodstain pattern analysis, shooting trajectory reconstruction, crime scene reconstruction, medical legal death investigation, and advanced crime scene processing methodology. So we have a great uh, show in store for you this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, ForensicWeek.com is a show that features real forensic science by real forensic scientists and investigators, real law enforcement officers, and real counterintelligence experts who find, collect, and examine forensic evidence in the performance of their duties. Broadcast live on your desktop right here every Thursday evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on www.forensicweek.com. We are a proud member of the Hangout10.com live TV webcast network, which is a series of shows recorded and broadcast live using Google+, a social networking service. The Forensic IQ Update report segment, researched and presented live by my student interns from the University of Maryland, who keep you up on current issues and events and training opportunities that are important in the forensic community. Student producers and interns with us this evening are from the George Washington University Department of Forensic Science, Laura Pachuki, producer, Stevenson University's Derek Wong from Baltimore County, Maryland, co-producer, and for the first time this evening, University of Maryland um, criminal justice major intern, an intern for me this coming spring 2014 semester, Noel Andres. Noel, pleasure to have you here. Noel will be working with two other students who you'll see in the next few weeks uh, doing research for the Forensic IQ update. Before I introduce our guest and begin this evening's discussion, let's hear from the producer of ForensicWeek.com, Laura Pachuki. Thanks, Tom. Hey, everyone. If you have any questions, comments, or future ideas for our show, please email us at ForensicWeek at gmail.com. You can watch all of our shows 24-7, 365 online at ForensicWeek.com, where all of our shows are archived. If you like our show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also search for us on, uh, on Facebook at the ForensicWeek.com show. Thanks. Thanks. Back to you, Tom. Okay, thank you, Laura. And, and let me just repeat what Laura just said. If you're watching the show live and you've got a question that we're not asking our guests, please uh, send that email. Laura will, will pick it up quickly, and she will make sure that that question gets, gets asked of our guests. That's very important. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our special guest this evening is Elizabeth Toomer, Assistant Special Agent in Charge of the Economic Crimes for NCIS. That's the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. I guess I don't have to say that anymore now that NCIS has, has their own TV show. Mm -hmm. um, and she is stationed in Washington, D.C. field office. Previously, she was the Supervisory Special Agent at the Forensic Sciences Division, NCIS headquarters. Uh, where she was involved in crime scene restoration, reconstruction, blood stain pattern analysis, attendance at postmortem and medical examinations, shooting incident reconstruction, instructor in various forensic training for domestic, international, and interagency law enforcement, and advanced crime scene investigation techniques. She was a special agent for the criminal investigation squad in Japan for three years, one of her assignments. Uh, and she is an adjunct professor in medical legal death investigation and blood stain pattern analysis for the forensic sciences department at the George Washington University. 
She's a participant in the National Institute of Justice Scientific Working Group on Bloodstain Pattern Analysis meetings. These scientific working groups consist of representatives like Elizabeth from the forensic, industrial, uh, commercial, and academic communities. Uh, these multidisciplinary groups assist in developing standards and guidelines and improve communication throughout their respective disciplines. So law enforcement officers and investigators throughout the country who are watching this show, if you're wondering how these national standards and guidelines are developed, it's these groups like the scientific working groups and we have the honor and pleasure this evening to have a member of the bloodstain pattern analysis uh, scientific working group Elizabeth Toomer. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you so much for having me. This is a good time of the year, kind of in between semesters um, from the fall and the spring, and it's right after the holiday, etc. So I know you're a busy person, uh, uh, and I appreciate you being here, and I also appreciate NCAS uh, allowing you to be on the show. Um, we're going to talk about crime scene reconstruction, and, and we want to focus a little bit about blood stain analysis. And I want to start, and I think I, men I mentioned this to you, uh, on a quote. I, I'm a lover of quotes, and I find that uh, when I give a lecture or a presentation, or even if I'm writing, um, if I'm trying to get my audience um, uh, to understand uh, the focus of uh, our objective of my presentation, I like to start off with a, with a quote. And I've got one for you. And it's a Sherlock Holmes quote, and it's a great one, uh, and it's from the uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Adventure of the Blanched Soldier. And during uh, this story, uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson is entering a crime scene, and the crime scene's not important at this point, but bottom line is um, Sherlock Holmes is walking through the crime scene using his deductive reasoning and basically telling Dr. Watson exactly what he believed happened while the commission of the crime occurred. A time in a place where Sherlock Holmes was not there. And Dr. Watson is, is standing there in amazement. And he said, I can't believe that you, we're both looking at the same thing, yet you can truly understand and, and, and capture information that I can't. And with that, Sherlock Holmes says, I see no more than you, but I have trained myself to notice what I see. So, Elizabeth, I'd like you to start off by saying, what have you done to train yourself to, when you go to a crime scene to be able to recognize and reconstruct the events that have or may have occurred? Well, after getting my master's degree in forensic science from George Washington University and getting hired by NCIS and working you know, hundreds of crime scene investigations, you, um, I received mentorship from other senior agents and other senior crime scene investigators because I had the scientific background and the training, but I didn't as you describe, um, have those skills of observation finally honed yet. So I might see things, but not know yet how to interpret them or what they meant. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time just trying to learn from a lot of other people and go to as many crime scenes as I could, whether they were significant incidents or minor incidents. And of course, through interviews and asking people, what did you see and what happened, you start to find out and be able to piece things together. And then the other key part of of forensic science that is always emphasized is the scientific emphasis through scientific method and things like that. So having the science background, then you go back to the lab and you try to do that reconstruction piece where you use scientific methods to conduct research experiments where you might drop blood, you know, drop blood from a particular height onto a different surface. Um, and so through that you can kind of answer some questions and say, oh, that's how that happened. And the more that you do that and the more scenes you get exposed to, you just start to be able to recognize things. Did you do that first as a field investigator uh, with NCIS or as a crime scene technician at the beginning? Um, in the beginning, I was, on, uh, I was a case agent doing criminal investigations and also on the crime scene investigation team. So I would work the crime scenes, but I wasn't yet specialized in forensics in my role at NCIS. So I didn't exclusively just do forensics those first couple of years. I did the full investigation, the interviews, the interrogations, also the crime scenes. 
Um, so during that time, I wasn't focused in terms of doing research and reconstruction. What What did you major in in undergraduate school? In in and did you receive a master of science in forensic science? Um, yes, I did receive a master. Of, uh, actually, it was called a master of forensic science at the time, MFS degree. That's the one I got. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, my undergraduate degree is what's called an allied health degree. Can you believe that I have to go in? <laughs> Hold on. You can uh, keep t going. <laughs> oh, okay. How do you like that? How do you like that? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that, to interrupt you. That chair you're sitting on looks really tiny too. <laughs> when you, oh no. When you got not. up, I thought, it's oh not. my gosh, that chair is tiny. No, no, it's no, it's a big dining room chair. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, well, my undergraduate degree was in um, in health, what's called health and society, which is an allied health degree that combines things like um, ethical decisions in medicine with all the pre med requirements, all the sci pre med science requirements. I I originally wanted to be a doctor and um, you know treat patients, and then I decided I wanted to be someone who was kind of um, not tied to an office or to an indoor hospital setting and wanted to be out there, you know, digging in the dirt and have every day be different. So great, great. Mm -hmm. All right, so at what point did um, you get involved in the forensics aspect of investigations? Uh, when I was in in my undergraduate years and thinking that I wanted to go to medical school, you know, just like so many other students who start off wanting to go to, you know, wanting to be pre-med and, and going that route, I decided to, um, I, I started to become interested in kind of um, um, law enforcement and, and investigative work and um, spent some time with a medical examiner's office. Um, I thought I wanted to go into toxicology. So I spent some time at a medical examiner's office, and they just happened to have what you know what we call in the law enforcement and, and medical field a, a floater, a body that had been recovered from a body of water after a number of days, you know, and quite distorted, quite enlarged, almost unrecognizable as a person even. Um, kind of takes on a soccer ball looking, the head takes on a soccer ball looking appearance. So the medical examiner mm -hmm. said to me, well, if you think you might be interested in this field, you know, I've got what is probably one of the most gruesome things for you to look at. And if you, you know, aren't disgusted, then maybe this field is for you. And showed me the body, and I thought, oh wow, that's really cool. And so that's that was I was hooked from from that point on. Very good. Okay, so let let's go right into the crime scene because time goes so quickly. Um, how significant is blood spatter to a case? Because I I you know I'm working now for the defense. And I see many cases that I work on where homicide, like, they totally ignore it. I mean, in, 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 so how significant is it? And um, do you believe that more training needs to be given? Because I see that a lot of law enforcement don't understand it enough to, to utilize the analysis. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. I don't think there's very many people who get sufficient training to draw conclusions in bloodstain pattern analysis. There's different tiers of training that qualify you to either document and observe um, bloodstain pattern analysis, and then more advanced levels allow you to draw conclusions. And so I, I agree with you that there's probably not a lot, uh, There's well, they're not probably, but there's definitely not a sufficient number of people who are trained to draw conclusions. Um, and uh, the other, you know, complicating factor about bloodstain patterns is it depends on the scene itself in terms of um, you know who the offender is in relation to the victim whether they are family members or related and and you know um, how much commingled evidence that you might have so it, it sometimes bloodstain patterns don't always have value um, in reconstructing an incident or in determining who's culpable so it does depend is it, is it fair to say that because uh, while you're at the sure how significant or helpful it will be so um, do do you believe or at least do you always record the blood uh, uh, spatter and patterns in case you do need them later on uh, is that an uh, is that a protocol for your uh, agency um, or do you decide at some point in time we need it or we don't need it so mm -hmm. don't bother with it 
Well, um, blood stain pattern analysis, um, you know, occurs after the scene examination. So our our procedures at NCIS is to fully document a scene to the extent um, and capability of the person who's documenting the scene. And NCIS works crime scenes in Iraq and Afghanistan on ships and you know piracy incidents. So there are circumstances where the documentation ability is limited due to weather or other extreme circumstances like a war zone. However, um, we always would fully document a crime scene and the person who is documenting it would be trained in how to document the entire scene. They might not know how to interpret blood stains, but one of our forensic specialists who are called forensic consultants would do that at a later time. So yes, it's always important to document the blood stain patterns because you never know what the incident might be and, and then that interpretation it would be conducted later if deemed appropriate. So I would I would imagine that the the forensic photographer or the evidence technician who's doing the crime scene photography need to have understand the basis of, of, of blood stain analysis to know what kind of photographs should be taken of a scene. Is that correct? Yep, that's true. It's not necessarily um, uh, photography of blood stain patterns isn't an en entirely separate discipline, but there is some understanding that you need to have about how to take close-up shots versus mid-range and where to place scales. Okay, so tell us a little bit about blood stain patterns and uh, when they're significant, what they tell us, because all a lot of our viewers know is what we see on CSI and forensic files. You know, some people think because you know, shows like Forensic Files are real cases that the way they're presented are real and you know as well as I do that it might be a real case but they tend to present it the way you know, Hollywood wants it presented and it's not always uh, the way it is. So give us some understanding because this is about real forensic science. Give us the real understanding of the significance of, of blood stain patterns and what kinds of things have been hel can be helpful in, in, a, in an investigation. Well, blood stain pattern analysis is the application of, of, of science to the interpretation of blood that's at a scene. So and when I say science, there's a couple of different scientific disciplines. There's, there's chemistry, there's physics, there's mathematics, um, and um, those disciplines are combined in, um, in the interpretation which happens later, but the documentation itself of blood stains um, needs to occur with an overall um, approach first to the crime scene. So overall photos documenting the entire condition of the of the um, scene itself need to be taken so that a blood stain pattern anal analyst can look at the scene in its totality. And then from there, um, a perspective needs to be um, documented in terms of placing scales and um, on grids on those particular blood stain surfaces and that is what we call the mid-range documentation. And then after that you move in closer within the grids and conduct what's called close-up documentation of specific, specific blood stains and that's where you're documenting close-up specific patterns that are with, within a blood stain surface. For example on a wall you may have two sets of spatter patterns um, and so you would need to document their relationship to each other, their relationship for example on the fixed surface which is that wall and then close-up photographs of the pattern itself. Uh, you're calling blood stain uh, analysis science. All right? Now science means that if two different experts looked at the same thing they would come with, out with the same conclusion. Does that always happen? No and um, blood stain pattern analysis is, is based on science in terms of the application of scientific methods to the documentation to the reconstruction aspect but anytime that you have somebody drawing a conclusion even fingerprint analysis and DNA analysis um, can have a subjectivity to it in terms of what um, aspects of alleles you place weight on or what aspects of ridges you place weight on so that's where the subjectivity can come in but in terms of an understanding of the discipline and the um, forensic or the um, science scientific fields that underlie it, that's where, you know, we know, for example, what the viscosity of blood is. We know how liquids fall, you know, with gravity and we know how liquids fall when force is applied. Those are the aspects that are the scientific basis of blood stain pattern analysis, which are uniform and are not subject to that, you know, kind of interpretation issue. 
I have a question? Go ahead. Um, so when it comes to bloodstain pattern an analysis or uh, crime scene reconstruction, other than uh, subjectivity, what are some other sources of error or potential sources of error that you encounter? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would call the... I, the subjectivity issue can be error or it can be a focus on different things. I think that's a really complex issue. But in terms of sources of error, I would say that probably one of the problems that we face um, um, in the United States and other countries as well, and Tom hit the nail on the head about this, talking about um, the scientific working groups and uh, their really important role in trying to define standards for practice. Um, what, what happens um, is that oftentimes you have, uh, you have a jurisdiction, a police department, an agency that is, you know, is limited in funding and can send um, a police officer, a special agent, whoever it is, to one course, which is one 40-hour course, and it might be a basic course. Those basic bloodstain courses don't qualify you to draw conclusions, um, and yet that might be all a crime scene investigator has received training in, and now they become that police department's expert and is rel are relied upon to document bloodstain scenes and also do some level of interpretation and draw conclusions. And so, you know, they're doing that without mentorship because they might be the only bloodstain trained person. They're probably doing it without peer review if they're the only blood bloodstained person in their uh, bloodstain trained person in their department, and that's where we see you know potential errors that are introduced is um, the lack of um, some of the oversight things that have become standardized in labs and standardized now through you know um, best practices that are emphasized by scientific working groups and things like that. So in those in those cases where uh, the examiners aren't certified, are they allowed to testify in court? You know, it depends on what they're testifying to. It depends on um, what the requirements are. Um, currently in the United States, there's no requirement for certification in crime scene investigation, <clears throat> excuse me, or bloodstain pattern analysis. So every agency has their own standards for what's required in order for people to do certain levels of crime scene investigation, documentation, and interpretation. Um, and usually a prosecutor is going to, you know, during the voir dire process, take a person through whether or not they meet their agency's qualifications and their experience level. So it is possible that in one jurisdiction you might be considered an expert and therefore qualified to provide um, opinion testimony on a certain subject. In another area you might not be qualified to do so. I see. <laughs> what kind of problems are you seeing in court where, because of that where uh, an investigator may be giving opinion uh, on blood stain analysis based on his or her experience <laughs> and not certified. Um, so how does the def defense uh, argue uh, that testimony? Well, um, as I mentioned, there's not currently a requirement for certification. So, uh, you know, in terms of the percentages of the people that are certified in bloodstain pattern analysis and which certifying body you would go to, and there are a couple out there that do it, you know, it's, it, there's no single source right now for a certification. So, um, you know, I think it would be pretty hard for anyone to say conclusively, oh, you lack this certification from this agency or this organization, and therefore you can't testify to bloodstains. So um, that's certainly is something that can be asked of an expert is whether or not they're certified and you know um, and there's a lot of really good explanations for that. Um, but in in terms of of people being um, excluded from testimony, you know, specifically because of lack of certification, um, I don't I don't think that would happen solely for that reason. It's probably probably would be a combination of factors. Um, you know, including you know inexperience or some of the other things I mentioned, like um, n um, no peer review conducted on a report or on findings. Okay, all right, very good. Um, uh, give us some uh, some examples where blood stain analysis made a different in, in, in made a difference in an investigation that it, it was that key piece of evidence that helped the jury, those 12 people who weren't smart enough to get out of jury duty, you know, those, those 12 people, uh, it made the difference for them uh, to uh, get a conviction. Um, I think the first, the first 
example that comes to mind are, are some of the cases that go to trial that are, are, are really complicated when you have, for example, a, a multiple shooting homicide and uh, the shooter claims that it was um, self-defense. Oftentimes, you know, depending on where the shots were, and let's just say they were to the torso, some people would argue that, well, if you shot that person eight times, how can that be self-defense? Well, of course, you know, you can't judge what someone's mindset is if they're going to start pulling the trigger, how fast they're pulling the trigger, and whether or not they're, you know, they're going to realize in their head, oh, I only need to shoot this person once, and that should do it. I mean, that's not necessarily reasonable. So where bloodstain pattern analysis is key in those kinds of cases, and it's been instrumental in trying to explain to the jury um, whether or not the incident occurred the way the shooter described, and, and I, I say it that way because it's not up to law enforcement to decide whether or not it was self-defense. The jury decides that, as you, as you mentioned, Tom. But what we can do is look at where bloodstain patterns are, for example, in a shooting scene, um, or where blood, blood has flowed on clothing, and that would allow us to determine a, position, a person's position at the time that they were shot and their blood was shed. And based on that, that can corroborate or refute a shooter's statement about, for example, a person being upright and continuing to come after them while they were being shot, or them being in proximity to the shooter. Because you can certainly still, you know, unlike the movies, you don't get one gunshot wound and, and are blown off your feet five feet backwards. Um, so you certainly can get shot and continue to move forward or continue to move. So bloodstain pattern analysis, looking at clothing, looking at um, patterns in the scene, especially multiple patterns, can help us to determine sequence, position, and especially position after bloodshed begins to help the jury to understand whether or not certain statements are in fact you know, true and line up with what we see at the scene. Do you have to do demonstrations in the laboratory um, in preparation of a case to be able to demonstrate to the jury that what your conclusions are, are based on, on, on sound, um, you know, scientific uh, um, data? And, and do you have to do you show uh, videos? Like on television a lot, you'll see all these ex uh, experiments where they're, uh, they're they're, uh, they're, sh they're shooting bags of, of uh, uh, pig blood uh, to show how it spatters, etc. Do, do, do you really do that to, to help convince or show the jury? We do, and um, it's, you know, it's case specific because, of course, um, shooting a live body uh, you know, and the person, the victim is a certain size or a certain body composition, S shooting a, a live person whose heart is beating and whose body temperature is a certain level is never going to be exactly the same as shooting a pig carcass or shooting an animal carcass or a, a bag of blood. So in some instances, um, in some instances, using, um, you know, an, a substitute alternative is helpful. Um, but in other cases, it's not necessarily helpful, and so we have to rely on just what we see in terms of bloodshed on clothing and, and spatter, and there's not a, a reconstruction or a research experiment that would be useful in, in reconstructing it. Um, but we do often do things, um, again, to, for example, corroborate movement post-bloodshed. That's an, often an issue that arises is, was the person shot and, for example, continuing to fight or continuing to move? Um, and so it's a common thing, um, a common thing, for us to get either fresh human blood or animal blood and reconstruct dripped blood, or you know um, what we call passive drips, or um, something that is, for example, a spatter incident on a surface and document how that occurred and corroborate whether or not it could have occurred the way it was described to have occurred. Do you always use some type of animal blood when you're doing these experiments? It depends. Um, sometimes we use, um, sometimes we do use animal blood. There's now um, some commercially available spatter blood products, um, and some of the, some of those products can be used again depending on the circumstances. And then other times we actually will have our own blood drawn or um, get blood, um, human blood from other sources, and utilize that in the reconstructions. Hmm. I have a question, Tom. Yes, go ahead. Um, coming in from a viewer to the show, um, they were wondering about um, types of software that you would use. Um, do you use a software like Chemospat, or 
Do you stream the trajectories? Um, there's a couple of different software products that are available and Hemispat is one of them. And on that note about software, um, Tom, you also asked about how incidents are reconstructed and, and how they're depicted. And um, one of the things that the field of forensics has moved towards is forensic graphics depictions. So some of the things that you see on TV now with, you know, 3D body models that rotate around and have, you know, a red rod coming out of the head to show a shooting trajectory path and things like that. Those kinds of things are being done by law enforcement now and, and by forensic um, scientists and forensic graphic artists to depict um, their reconstruction or to depict what a medical examiner has determined occurred in terms of a sequence of injuries or a wound path. So those kinds of things are actually quite common now and um, you know you see them on TV but they, they do actually, um, they are things that we do in law enforcement as well. Uh, okay. Uh, Sorry, I have another question coming in from our viewer for Elizabeth, um, asking if you have anticoagulants in the blood for the experiments. Uh, that's a good question. It, uh, when we commercially purchase blood, they usually have anticoagulants in the blood, and depending on what type of experiment we're doing and um, and whether we need um, anticoagulants or preservatives in the blood, um, sometimes they do have that, and other times we use fresh blood with no additives, no preservatives, and no anticoagulants. So we, so we use both. Anything else, Laura? Nope, that was it. No, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, viewer. Great question. Um, oh, great. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned computer graphics, folks. So, so the people using these software packages, are they actually computer graphics people that are working with the, uh, um, the uh, scientists? Is that correct? Yes, they're, um, it, the software is, is pretty complex um, and some of the gaming platforms and things like that are used for these body models. So it's quite complex um, and um, yes, the people who usually are the ones that are doing those reconstructions um, and even you know showing cars going down the street and crashing into each other and all of those things, usually those people are um, have a background in graphic artists uh, graphic arts or um, forensic graphic arts. Have you uh, had experience in using 3D laser technology uh, scanning? Um, I haven't used it myself but um, I've seen it used and our agency uses it as well as a bunch of other agencies and it's definitely um, an asset and certainly an advance over you know tape measures and, and rolling rulers and all of those kinds of things. So really a great tool now that we use. Yeah, you know, there's only one uh, one uh, vendor that I know of in Maryland, the state of Maryland where I'm from, that uh, that has that technology and they they contacted me and they said, hey, we want to we want to move, we're doing traffic accidents and uh, building engineering uh, stuff, but we really like to get into the crime scene uh, arena and that's why we're calling you. Uh, I said okay, uh, he said, you know, and they said, you know, we're trying to get the police to use this and we just can't we just can't get them to use our services. I said it's because it costs money and the police investigators have to determine, you know, um, and they can't just go out and, and, and pay you for the services. So my suggestion to, uh, to them was go get the defense to use you. When the defense uses you enough, mm -hmm. the police will be forced to have to buy your services. Otherwise, uh, you know, it would be a problem. So I don't know if they're doing that or not, but uh, I found that um, uh, to be very helpful. Let me ask you, uh, in reference to uh, blood spatter from uh, bullet trajectory, etc., how does um, the blood stain analyst work with the firearms identification person? Or it, are there firearms ID people who are in fact bl uh, blood spatter uh, analysts based on um, uh, bullet trajectory? Um, you're asking if the if people who are uh, if, if people who conduct blood stain pattern analysis um, would also do the shooting trajectory analysis? Well, no, firearms identification experts. Oh, okay. they, uh, do they work in conjunction with? Uh, you know the blood spatter person, or are there fi firearms identification person who are determining, you know, 
you know, that the ammunition came from a certain gun. Are they also doing the, uh, the ballistics portion uh, in reference to blood spatter? Yes, we usually do work with them, um, and especially because, you know, bullets um, travel, you know, through bodies or through a surface and can travel through multiple surfaces. So there's, there's evidence that gets collected to even confirm whether um, a suspected defect is a bullet impact and, and then also to look at whether or not particular types of ammunition would have continued to travel, for example, through a body, maybe through a chair, and then into the wall. Um, and if you have multiple, you know, gunshots, then you have to figure out which bullet went which way, and you you can get, you know, alterations in the trajectory as the bullet slows down and things like that. So, so yes, that can be important in reconstructing the overall event. Okay, I have been involved in, in the investigation of a couple of murder cases that involved a person being struck on the head, uh, one with a blunt force uh, instrument, and the other one with a with a hatchet. Uh, a question for you is that if a person is laying down and you're hitting them in the uh, in the head, okay, mm -hmm. um, as they're hitting uh, the person and, and blood is pooling, uh, is that blood going to come back towards the person um, with the force coming from generally or does it depend on uh, on their positioning of the body of the person? You're saying is the is the blood that's pooling due to the impacts to the head going to also be set into motion? Should, the, impacts yeah, should the person into who's doing the hitting be full of blood? Um, you know, it depends. The head is tricky because it's a movable object. Um, so you can you can have the head rotate, you know, away or towards, for example, and then it also depends on whether or not the surface the head is on is absorbent or non-absorbent. Um, and you said the blood was pooling, and of course you can have blood pooling on absorbent surfaces as well. Um, but um, so you know, with a head, it, I, I would say it just it just depends on where the where the um, offender is standing, how long the object is, and things like that. But you can absolutely deliver multiple blows to someone on their head and be standing in a position where you might not get a lot of blood on you. But you get it would be difficult not to get some blood on you. Would you agree? I would agree. It depends on the number of blows, though, um, because the object that the object that is the you know you mentioned the blunt force object that that object would also if you're delivering multiple blows and blood is being shed enough to pool, that object is probably going to have some blood on it. And so as the offender continues to swing that object, they're going to probably cast off some blood onto themselves and onto other surfaces. Okay, I got a good one for you. This is a little historical. Um, uh, case. It's actually, we could call it a cold case because the person uh, arrested uh, was found not guilty. Lizzie Boyd took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41, which is all lies because um, the mother only got 18 wax and uh, the father got about 11 wax. Um, she was found not guilty. Are you familiar with Liz that case? A all? little bit. Mm -hmm. 18 yeah, 1892. My, my question was, if Lizzie did this, because uh, Tom Lang from the O.J. Simpson case, mm -hmm. he and I reinvestigated the case and went to Fall River, Massachusetts and looked at the physical evidence and had the ax in our hand. And, 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 and they actually had crime scene photographs from 1892. I didn't even know they had photography in 1892. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. but uh, she, within within... 10 to 15 minutes after the father was hit repeatedly uh, in the front of the face and the head with an, with an axe, or they believed to be an axe, at least they found one nearby. Um, within, within 15 minutes, um, the maid from the top floor came down and saw Lizzie Borden in front of the body with not one drop of blood on her. And, uh, of course, this is 1892, no running water in the kitchen. You had to go in the basement to pump, to pump the well water, okay? Uh, is it possible that, uh, that somebody could actually take an ax to somebody and within 15 minutes clean up perfectly? Do you think that's possible? Uh, I, you know, I would say probably not, but, you know, I guess it would depend on 
how closely anybody actually looked at her for the blood in 1892. I mean, you certainly something like that. You can get missed, small missed um, blood stains and things like that. And if you're not looking closely, you certainly could miss it. So you know, I don't know if she was wearing dark clothing or light clothing. Um, I don't. I don't know how big she was and how heavy the axe was. If she wielding it over her shoulder multiple times she's likely to cast blood off you know off the end of the object and things like that but if she's not doing a full swing you know then the blood's not traveling as far off the end of the object so there's a lot of factors that I guess I would have to look into um, to, to be able to say for sure but but I'll also say that you know nothing is impossible <laughs> it's all kinds yeah. of explanations for things and um, you know I have a, a, a forensics instructor who once said um, there is a universe of possibilities and your job as a forensic scientist is to look at based on facts, based on science, what is the most likely what is the most likely possibility but that doesn't mean that there's always a universe of other possibilities that you also have to consider and at least examine whether or not you know they hold more weight, equal weight or things like that. Yeah, because that's exactly what the defense does you know, the defense mm -hmm. looks at all the other possibilities. Exactly. After the... So let's talk a little bit about the... Let's. I'm sorry. Wait, Tom, I have a question. Oh, go. Okay. When a scene has been cleaned up by the perpetrator, Elizabeth, have you been able to perform bloodstain pattern analysis with the use of blood-enhancing reagents, such as Blue Star? Um, when this, when this, um, first of all, we consider um, blood stain pattern analysis to include, you know, documentation, to include um, analysis of blood stains, but um, and and to include, you know, reconstruction or in, in full interpretation of the incident. But when you have an incident uh, that has been cleaned up, and you use um, any type of um, tools to um, reveal or or examine for the um, for the presence of blood that's been altered or cleaned up, it um, that's still considered a component of blood stain pattern analysis. Um, however, it could limit your ability to draw conclusions, for example, about the type of pattern, whether it was a spatter pattern or a transfer pattern or things like that. So, yes, you can still do the analysis, which means determining that, yes, there was blood here and, yes, it was cleaned up, but you might not be able to say, for example, the you know, victim was down low and and stayed down low while they shed blood and things like that, or to even identify the types of blood stains. I have a question as well. Um, so when we were talking about Lizzie Borden and the uh, the maid, that's that's an eyewitness account, right? So we we all know that sometimes eyewitness accounts can be unreliable. So have there been any cases where the blood stain pattern analysis uh, came up with a different um, result compared to what the eyewitness account was and how do you resolve those issues? That's a really good question. Um, I think that you know um, I'm in law enforcement so you're you're right to talk about eyewitness accounts and how um, that sometimes doesn't um, completely match up with what we observe at a scene um, and even with what multiple witnesses will report. They'll frequently conflict with each other which again is why we try to rely on science and facts and what can be proven to have occurred. Um, and one of the things that I think is a common thing with bloodstain pattern analysis um, that uh, you know that that you you have to be careful to put too much weight on again unless you prove it and unless you um, are relying on facts is that uh, people tend to report um, the volume of blood flow uh, as being you know in large amounts. So, for example, I could take, you know, a small coffee cup of blood and throw it on a wall, and it's really a small coffee cup of blood. And someone else just looking at that scene and seeing that coffee cup of blood might say, there was so much blood that there is no way the person who shed that blood is still living. You know, and those are the kinds of things that we'll get when we hear eyewitness um descriptions of a, of a bloody scene. They'll usually describe the volume as having been so much blood and things like that. And then when we get there and we look at it, you know, we're thinking, oh, that's really not that much blood. And, um, so bloodstain pattern analysis looks at what we observe, what we can reproduce, um, what where are the injuries, what did the medical examiner say about it, 
um, and um, and what does the evidence look like in terms of clothing, bullets, things like that. At bloodstain pattern analysis doesn't include, unless there's a specific aspect, it doesn't include, um, you know, relying on as fact what a witness or someone else has reported. There may be an aspect to the interpretation where we marry up the findings that we have and say, is it consistent with what someone reported? But we don't rely on that as a fact pattern on which to conduct our conclusions. That's it. Great. Any other questions? OK. Uh, how often does um, blood stain, well, not. let's just talk about crime scene reconstruction. Um, how often uh, do we communicate with the investigators in reference to what suspects are saying, what witnesses are saying, uh, to help understand the reconstruction process? Because many times I look at reconstructing a crime scene, sometimes, can I, I, I don't want to use the word guess, but are we sometimes guessing on what we believe happened based on scientific evidence that bears it out, but uh, but they, as you mentioned, it could be other possibilities. That is that fair to say? Right. Um, the the inclusion of kind of extraneous information or investigative information is is somewhat incident specific. Um, for example, there was a uh, suspected homicide scene that I worked where. Um, I was asked to assist another police department um, that had already started to do some of the scene examination and uh, I knew that they had a person in custody um, who had an explanation for how the incident, how the homicide occurred. Um, and for, for the purposes of what they wanted to know from bloodstain pattern, blood pattern analysis which was how did this happen in, in terms of where did the shooting occur, where, did it in, where was it initiated, and um, what position was the victim who was the one primary person shedding blood and the suspect in at the times of bloodshed. Those were their questions. What, what positions were they likely in, so upright versus you know, prone on the ground or supine. Um, and, and where did bloodshed occur that is related to the incident, so related to the shooting. So we're looking for specific types of blood stains. So based on that very specific question that they wanted to know, there was no investigative information in terms of a suspect's explanation or a suspect's story that the bloodstain pattern analysis or the bloodstain pattern analyst needs to know. So in that situation, um, I made sure that detectives and other investigators provided me with no information at all about what was reported by the suspect, no information about what was reported by first responders when they got to the house, um, EMTs, and, and any of that information. And the analysis was done completely based on what was observed at the scene, what, um, what was documented you know, that was um, useful to the interpretation, and um, medical examiner and other scientific reports, DNA, fingerprints, things like that, um, and then the bloodstain pattern analysis itself. And never during the bloodstain pattern analysis portion did I look at any of the um, suspect statements because that had nothing to do with what did I observe and what does it mean and where people shed blood and whose blood is it and things like that. So it is case specific but there's definitely circumstances where you just don't need to know any of that information to do what we do. Okay. Uh, there are tens of thousands of small police departments out there in the country, in the world, you know, that don't have the same resources as a federal agency like NCIS uh, or any large police department like uh, IPD or, or a large county agency like a lot of the county agencies in Maryland are very large and they have a lot of resources. What does that investigator who goes to that crime scene in that small police department, how do they get some type of help uh, in this area when they say, my God, you know, I've got blood everywhere and I don't know what it means. What do they do? The best thing they can do is just apply good crime scene investigation um, documentation skills. So again, it's the photography, it's the proper sampling of blood stain patterns that look distinct. So sampling every blood stain pattern that looks different from you know the one it's adjacent to 
and that way you can later on request DNA analysis to determine whose blood is present at the scene and, and whose blood is present where. Um, but if they do a good photographic documentation, um, which includes those overall photographs, the mid-range photographs, and the close-up photographs, combined with proper sampling and proper evidence handling um, of blood-stained items, bloody clothing, bloody carpet, things like that. If they do that and they have access to someone who can assist them at a later time, they still can benefit from the same type of blood stain pattern analysis information as, as, as they could, you know, having someone at the scene with them. Well, if I belong to a small police department and I send all my physical evidence to the state crime lab, um, typically would a state crime lab have the resources to be able to do that analysis? It depends by jurisdiction. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of variation. But some of the state crime labs have um, have DNA analysts who are cross-trained as blood stain pattern analysts and do lab-based blood stain pattern analysis from the photographs. And some of them also go out to scenes and do blood stain pattern analysis at the scene. Do, uh, does NCIS ever get asked uh, by local jurisdictions, wherever you might have a field office, uh, to assist? And does that happen? Yes, um, we do get asked, and yes, we do assist. And NCIS has um, about 150 different offices worldwide. So we're also in other countries, and in other countries, we're also often relied upon for assistance with um, bloodstain pattern analysis and other advanced forensic analysis. Okay, I'd like you to put your uh, professor uh, hat on, if you would. Um, and we want to focus because uh, time is, we've only got six more minutes. Uh, we have listeners who are saying, hey, this is something I'm interested in. Uh, what do I need to do? What, uh, I'm, it could be a high school student. It could be a college student. Uh, what kind of courses should I take? What kind of program should I get involved in? If I'm interested in not only law enforcement, and because we, we, we understand that, but I would be interested in going into the areas that you just talked about that you've been involved with uh, in your career. What kind of courses should they take? What kind of skills do they need to have? What direction do they need to go in? Well, That's a big um, question, but yeah. that's probably some of the most important things that we do in uh, Forensic Week. It's a great question, and you know these days the economy is is tough, so you certainly don't want to spend money getting a degree that doesn't help you to reach your goals. So, um, as you mentioned, Tom, there's a lot of um, variation out there between um, local agencies, state agencies, and federal agencies. So, what I always tell people who think they're interested in going into a career in forensic science, whether it's crime scene based or lab based, I always tell them to try to figure out what's their dream job, what's their ultimate goal. Are they wanting to be an NCIS forensic consultant and scientist? Or are they wanting to work in a DNA lab? Figure out what they think their goal is and then start looking at the minimum education requirements for those jobs. If you think that you want to go work for the FBI and work in their DNA lab, look at their website and see what they require their DNA analysts to have in terms of a degree. If you think that you would like to be a, a crime scene investigator with your local police department, they're going to have different education and experience requirements than other places. So the, the question varies based on what a person's goal is. Um, to, to go into a law enforcement based crime scene investigation or forensics role, um, if, you're, if you're going in as a local police officer, Oftentimes, you know, you can have a, um, an undergraduate degree or even just a high school diploma and become a police officer and then later on get cross-trained as a crime scene investigator. If you're looking to go into federal law enforcement, a minimum education requirement is going to be a bachelor's degree. And what specialty you get that degree in is going to be specific to what you're interested in doing. Um, we always emphasize um, at NCIS, uh, if you're interested in forensics, um, having a master's degree in forensic science. That's a requirement for anyone in the NCIS forensics division. And um, other federal agencies have a similar requirement, but state and, and local agencies may not have a requirement for a master's degree. So again, it's kind of aiming high, then looking at the minimum requirements and, um, and pursuing your degrees as appropriate. I have a and, question and me, about that. I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to remind our listeners that on February 20th, uh, um, we will be doing a live show at the uh, American Academy of Forensic Sciences uh, meeting in Seattle, 
and we will be participating in the uh, university fair where all the universities around the country that have forensics programs will be there to, uh, to talk about their programs and each and every one of those representatives will be on uh, forensically.com live uh, to to share uh, that program so those of you who are interested in learning about different programs like George Washington University like Stevenson University and many more around the country uh, February 20th live uh, in fact it's going to end up it's going to be a two hour show because uh, the program is two hours and if there's that many programs and we're going to we're going to spend the time to do that I'm sorry Laura did, were you going to say something Oh yeah, I just had a question about um, the studies to do for certain jobs. Um, with the crime scene reconstruction, are the reconstructionists, are they going out into the field to collect the evidence or are they mainly going off of like the detailed descriptions of what the crime scene looked like and what the evidence that was collected? I think it varies by agency. Um, for NCIS, because our um, agency is so spread out. We can have crime scenes happen, as I mentioned, in <laughs> Afghanistan, on a ship, and in many places that um, our forensic consultants or our forensic specialists can't get to, you know, in a timely manner to process a crime scene. So for NCIS, it depends on where the incident occurs and how quickly we can respond, especially if it's in a remote area. Um, for other agencies, um, crime scene investigators, crime scene reconstructionists, in general prefer to be at the scene. It's the best way to get information and make the observations yourself. But it's not always ideal based on resources and things like that. And, and those kinds of advanced trained forensics um, experts are usually you know, few and far between at most jurisdictions. So they can't necessarily go to every scene. So for to be a crime scene reconstructionist, be, um, uh, sorry, to uh, do it on the computer, make 3D models about the crime scene and everything. Mm -hmm. um, do you suggest that that person have a background in forensic science as well as uh, digital media or just digital media, just forensic science? Um, the, the folks who do the um, software-based um, forensic graphic reconstructions oftentimes have um, advanced degrees or specialized training in the forensic graphics arts and, or I'm sorry, in graphic artists and uh, or graphic arts and not in forensics because they're going to work in tandem with the forensic specialist, with a crime scene investigator, and with a medical examiner. So those folks usually may have limited forensics training but extensive training in graphic art. Okay. Uh, I don't want I don't want us to forget that you know sometimes we may not have to go for a program but like even a criminal justice major you have a lot of electives and I find a lot of my criminal justice majors are taking electives that have absolutely nothing to do with any career they're just filling in time to get their 120 uh, two credits or 21 or whatever it is 120 credits I don't remember what it is uh, but uh, the point is, there's a lot of opportunities to take specific courses in physics, uh, in uh, visual arts, uh, various things that that can provide you with some skills that that could be helpful. So uh, there, uh, there's that opportunity also. I, I'm looking at the time, and unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to uh, start signing off uh, before uh, we actually say goodbye. Uh, to Elizabeth and every time I start talking to you Elizabeth my mouse stops working but uh, there it goes. Um, I do want to mention um, um, what the schedule of events uh, looks for for the next several weeks. Um, June, uh, January 4, uh, 16th next week we have uh, Sandy Enslow who is a forensic artist uh, for Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department uh, she's a, a member of the general section of the American Academy of Forensic Science, like Elizabeth and myself. Um, she uh, is really excited about being on the show, and we're really excited to learn more about forensic uh, artistry and the various type things she does at, uh, for Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. So that's next week, uh, January 16th. The following uh, Thursday, January 23rd, we have some uh, some guests that have been on several times. We have Joe uh, Giacalone uh, and John uh, Paolucci, both retired uh, NYPD homicide investigators and crime scene uh, experts, um, and they have been asking me to say, hey, listen, we'd like to do a show with Dr. Rich Safferstein, 
uh, from uh, New Jersey, who's been on our show several times, um, who is the uh, uh, the author of most forensic uh, science uh, textbooks out there for general forensic science areas. Uh, great guy. So the three of them are going to be on the show. Um, and um, I know that uh, we'll be talking about some of the things that we talked about in the show this evening because uh, John Paolucci, his, his area of expertise is in blood uh, in blood analysis and in, in DNA. Uh, he was responsible for uh, de uh, establishing and determining um, all cases for NYPD in reference to DNA and when it would be analyzed, etc. So, uh, uh, in both of them are uh, trainers uh, in uh, doing some great things in uh, during the retirement years. Uh, so that's January 23rd. January 30th is open where we have a couple of different uh, um, guests that we're talking to. I'll let you know more about that next week. February 6th, we have the honor and pleasure of having the president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, Dr. Barry uh, Logan from Pencil, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, he's a DNA expert, but uh, he's coming on to talk about the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and the forensic science community. AAFS is the premier and largest forensic science um, professional organization in the world. Their members are, are come from around the world and uh, Dr. Logan uh, as president this year has been focusing on mentorship um, of, uh, of students and people interested in going in forensic science and uh, so we're excited about him coming. Um, February 13th we have uh, Dr. Jane uh, Bach who is a forensic uh, botanist. She testified in the uh, Casey Anthony case uh, and uh, she uh, has uh, some amazing uh, uh, amazing cases to talk to us about and to give us an appreciation and understanding for the significance of vegetation that we may find um, in, a, in a crime scene and what it says, what it means and uh, when it's important and how to collect it etc. So that's a February 13th. February 20th uh, is the um, the week of the AAFS meeting in Seattle, Washington. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be uh, doing a live show. It will be a special two-hour show. Uh, even though it's from 7 to 9, it will be uh, specific, uh, Pacific uh, Standard Time, so the time will be different. We'll, we'll tell you all about that, but we will be uh, um, talking with all the representatives of all the forensic science uh, programs in, in universities. And the last one we have scheduled just recently, February 23rd, uh, Dorothy Sims, who's an attorney, um, her specialty is prepping witnesses for trial um, and prepping uh, forensic experts uh, to understand the, how they'll be cross-examined and how to prepare for uh, both criminal and civil cases. She's written several books uh, on the subject and uh, she will be with us on uh, February 27th. So, with that, um, uh, I'd like to thank Special Agent and Professor Elizabeth uh, Toomer for uh, being on our show th um, this week. Elizabeth, it was an honor and a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And uh, uh, somebody who was very quiet uh, tonight, Noel um, uh, Andres. Um, Noel, uh, you'll be hearing a lot from him uh, in, the next, in the oncoming weeks uh, when the semester begins, and he will be doing his research uh, for forensic uh, IQ uh, update report. So, uh, Noel, thank you for uh, sitting in on the show. Meanwhile, tell all your friends and uh, colleagues to tune in and keep watching ForensicWeek.com every Thursday evening, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And remember that if you can't make the show live, within five minutes after we're done, it's archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can watch not uh, just the show from that week, but any of the uh, uh, 45 shows that are, are in uh, the archive uh, YouTube uh, channel. So uh, we hope the content presented in this show as well as the previous ForensicWeek.com shows um, has opened up your eyes and curiosity to the wonders of uh, forensic and criminal justice sciences. We're here to provide you with the information that you think is important so if we're missing something or if you've got a topic uh, of interest that uh, you would like us to uh, uh, deal with here on the show, all you have to do is send us an email, as Laura said earlier, 
Uh, and we uh, would like to thank the uh, viewers who uh, um, who typed in our uh, questions to us uh, this evening. And I want you to continue to do that. So thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, um, see you next next week. Bye bye now. Thank you.